Okay, great. talk about this paper that we wrote together with uh, Alfredo Guevara, but maybe Donald O'Connell and Justin Vines, um, which I think has something to do with the topic of this workshop. So um, uh, as, as, a, as a short introduction, uh, let me set the stage. Uh, what I, I'm going to talk about uh, is related to the activity uh that is going on now where people many people uh including the people in the audience uh use the scattering amplitudes to go to classical general relativity and uh, uh get results that are complementary new results that are complementary to those obtained by classical methods and um there's uh some aspects of this activity related to the inclusion of classical spin into the uh, binary um, uh, binary uh, in spiral problem that on the amplitude side uh, on the amplitude side involves uh, large quantum spins and uh, actually yesterday at least Alfredo has uh, given a nice talk about um, aspects of that um, from uh, the point of view of his paper from last December. And uh, what he mentioned already la uh, yesterday was uh, that these amplitudes uh, formulated by Cunningham and Huang Huang in uh, 2017, uh, called, uh, which they call minimal coupling amplitudes, uh, they turn out to have uh, some exponentiation pattern in terms of the spin operator. Um, so in, in this uh, formula, I'm writing a spin S amplitude, a three-point amplitude where there's a massive incoming and a massive outgoing with the same mass. And there is a graviton that couples to this uh, massive particle. Uh, it has a spin S uh, and uh, a very nice uh, subset of, of such amplitudes. Uh, that could, can be written for uh, such a process uh, can be just written in this uh, one-term form. Um, and uh, the point of this uh, arrow is that there's the part that is really spinless, the just the scalar interaction and the spinning, uh, the, the spinning, um, uh, the, the coupling of the, of the spin uh, to the graviton can be actually seen to be uh, containing just one exponent. So an, um, um, a, uh, a counterpart of, uh, of this in gauge theory can be written very similarly. Uh, so I can just write uh, some massive spinner notation that I don't even have to go into a lot of details now. Uh, the, this X is the helicity uh, factor due to the massless guy. So for graviton, it was this X squared. For uh, a glue one, it would be, or, or a photon, it would be just X. There's some charge or gauge the, uh, gauge group generator that I could be I could put here and then uh, the exponentiation pattern is really the same and uh, again uh, Alfredo mentioned that yesterday uh, where the a30 is the scalar part um, so uh, well uh, the point of uh, the, these papers and uh, a lot of others uh, is to use this kind of amplitudes to uh, pr produce results for uh, for Kerr for for, for Kerr black holes, but uh, the gauge theoretic counterpart that uh, is also straightforward to write uh, can be called square root of Kerr. Um, it's an excellent toy model. Uh, it was uh, outlined uh, 
how nice it is uh, in this paper by Kenny Huang, uh, Hamid Huang and O'Connell. Um, and uh, it used to be actually called not squared curve. It, uh, Justin told me that it, um, the other name it has been called in the literature was magic charge. Uh, but the point is that this workshop is about, uh, is about the double copy and I will be talking about the, this, uh, uh, the aspects of, 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 of current interactions and also of square root current interactions. And there will be a double copy uh, all, uh, all the time with us where uh, on the amplitudes side, we can square uh, minimal coupling amplitudes here like this uh, to get a, a gravitational minimal coupling amplitudes like that. It's almost trivial at this point, but on the classical side, so in this talk, I want to really talk about purely classical physics implications of, uh, of, of this kind of activity. Um, I will, uh, um, on the classical physics side, there will be a classical double copy uh, between a square root curve or this magic charge and uh, curve black holes, at least at the level of uh, linearized uh, first-order interactions with the either gauge field or the graviton. So this is the, um, uh, the introduction. Uh, so the outline I want to, uh, in this talk, I want to first outline what I mean by the square root of curve and how I, I uh, 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 describe it classically using a word line action. Then uh, I will rewrite this action using a world sheet. Uh, and then I will double copy it to curve. So this will be a somewhat uh, exotic sort of double copy. Uh, it will be a classical double copy, a classical and perturbative double copy. And I think it fits nicely uh, into the, in the, to the, theme of this workshop. Uh, and then I will uh, take this world, sh world sheet action for Kerr and expand it, show it, show that it's actually the same as the multiple expansion form uh, of the Kerr, perturbative Kerr action that uh, is well known to our classic, classical GR friends. Uh, and if I have time, I can also comment on uh, spin equations of motion that were also considered in that paper. So uh, uh, yeah, and this this is a uh, uh, a live talk, so I, I will be writing out things uh, in in, uh, um, in real time. So please uh, don't hesitate to um, to to ask questions uh, whenever you feel like it just un unmute yourself and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, if, if there's no, no questions on the introductory part, let me proceed. But if there is, just unmute yourself, please. Um, so let me uh, uh, start with uh, indeed imagining a word line where there's a, uh, there's a, our particle that uh, is point-like, and I want this particle to be uh, spinning. So it's it doesn't it, it's not enough for me to just consider this word line uh, R of tau, but I, I, I should also introduce some um, uh, body fixed tetrad. Uh, I don't know. Let me draw it something like this. Um, so th there will be a. Um, uh, the, uh, the the velocity vector u tau, but then there's also this uh, uh, body fixed tetrad. I'll put a hat on it to say that it's, it's really related to the body. And uh, well, let me uh, denote it in this way. And the whirl line action, uh, I'll write it. Uh, well, it depends on the on the proper time. Uh, I or an, another curve parameter, uh, and I'll write it in terms of first the scalar 
part of the action. Um, so this would be just the uh, point charge so far. But then I also introduce uh, a spin tensor and uh, a, uh, an angular velocity tensor. And this is the free part. Well, it's not already, I've already introduced some minimal coupling to, to the gauge field. Uh, but the point here, I guess, is that the um, uh, this uh, angular uh, momentum tensor is related in the following way to the body fixed attract. So I think. So yeah, so this is the part that is sort of obvious to write if, if you know what you're doing on the word line, uh, but then there's uh, the, the rest of the action that um, should depend on the position of the particle, should depend on the spin of the particle. It could possibly also depend on the, on the tetrad, but uh, usually we assume that it doesn't. And then we also assume that it depends on the gauge field, of course. It, it's the interacting part that is not included in, in just this uh, uh, monopole uh, uh, point charge Coulomb-like uh, interaction. But of course, it should, all, it should depend on the gauge field on the word line. So, uh, that's that's the setting. That's the basic setting for considering this uh, uh, this sort of spinning word line actions. Uh, please ask questions if I have been too fast here. Let me uh, reorganize things a little bit just to have more room. Um, and well, there's. Um, uh, one thing that is already uh, you, you can notice here is that I, I'm not being really um, uh, being symmetric with respect to the position and the tetrad. So I, I have the tetrad and uh, and the momentum and, and the angular momentum, but I really don't have the linear momentum. I've only introduced the velocity. Uh, so the linear momentum, uh, can be really just defined uh, as uh, well. Of course, the Lagrangian is what we are integrating here, and uh, the momentum can be defined as the partial derivative. And if you compute it, it's uh, going to be something like that plus some order inter of interactions. Uh, so the way I wrote this action, it actually has uh, two uh, non-trivial, um, two non-trivial uh, symmetries. One of them is the reparameterization uh, gauge freedom. It, it's not gauge in terms of the gauge field. It's just it's it's the reparameterization in terms of choosing different towns. Uh, and there's another freedom that's called spin gauge freedom. Um, uh, which was very nicely considered uh, and explained by uh, Jan Stanhoff uh, in his solo uh, uh, notes uh, from 2015. So, well, the standard way to fix the reparameterization gauge freedom is just to set a tau to be the proper time and basically say that u squared is equal to minus well to one in mostly plus, uh, mostly minus, uh, and then that basically means that p mu is more or less m u mu. Uh, if we are being perturbative, we can. Uh, we can start neglecting things that uh, 
are linear in interaction because we will already be carrying interaction once. And then if you uh, start you, you uh, plug in that stuff, you, you, that will amount to second order. Um, so in that sense, I will actually be quite uh, uh, just I, I will be working at linear order in the interaction. So uh, whenever I talk about the velocity and the linear momentum, I basically mean that they're the same up to the mass rescaling. Uh, so this is about the reparentization freedom, uh, but a much more interesting freedom is the spin gauge freedom. And uh, the standard way to fix it is to use the so-called spin uh, supplementary spin condition and set the spin tensor to be transverse to, to, the, to the momentum with respect to, to the linear momentum. Um, and once you do that, uh, you can define a, uh, a spin pseudo vector uh, by dualizing the spin um, tensor with the momentum. So actually, uh, this pseudo vector contains the same information uh, as, uh, as the spin tensor, provided that it satisfies uh, the spin supplementary condition. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is the setup that is so far in no way fixed to curve uh, to square root curve. This is what you need to, well, you at least this is what you may do for any kind of uh, spinning point-like object um, that is classically moving on some word line, and you want to couple it to engage field. Um, is there any questions uh, so far about this? further make it smaller um, so then uh, let me proceed to actually adding interactions to this that um, I will again only consider up to linear order in, in the charge in the interaction with the gauge field uh, but I will be very uh, democratic here. I will really allow pretty much anything that uh, I can possibly write. So the, the, there are still some requirements that I will need to satisfy. So one thing is that since A is a pseudo vector, and I want my uh, action to be a scalar, not a pseudo scalar. Uh, every time I have A, I need to also somewhere have some pseudo vector or something else like that. Uh, moreover, of course, I want to write uh, things in terms of F mu nu. Uh, I want it to really be uh, so, yeah, in fact, when I said that it's function of a, I, I rather meant that it's a function of f mu. I want it to be uh, really gauge invariant. Uh, and this is anti-symmetric, so I cannot write two u's here. I cannot write two a's here. I really have to write u and a. Um, but a is a pseudo vector. So, and uh, if I have a, um, even number of uh, objects like this, then this has to be dualized. So this is just from parity. On the other hand, if I'm, uh, so the factorials are of course just conventions because I've introduced some free coefficients here, uh, but the odd part, the odd number of differentiations like that will uh, necessarily mean that this is not a dualized, but this is really just f mu itself. Uh, so this is a very general 
way to write this interaction. Um, and it's, of course, it sits on the word line. So it contains a lot of derivatives uh, of, uh, of the field strength and um, contains three coefficients. And uh, you might ask why I didn't include anything like that. Well, this would be uh, uh, a derivative contracted with the velocity. So this would be a total uh, proper time derivative, which, would, uh, which wouldn't contribute to the action uh, in the normal sense. It would be a total derivative in the action. So that's why all the derivatives here are uh, contracted with, with a spin, uh, spin vector. Uh, so this is an ansatz. This this uh, this is a general form uh, of such an action that is linear in the in, in the field strength in the gauge field. And uh, now only at this point I want to fix myself to squared curve, and I, by doing that I will fix my free coefficients uh, and this. Uh, I will do that by requiring that the amplitude uh, is indeed an exponential. So k dot a. So this times the cool Coulomb part. So this would be the, just the Coulomb part in, from the classical point of view. Um, and uh, plus minus going to p plus q. So this is really just this kind of amplitude, but written after the classical limit has been taken. Um, so, um, well, th this is written in, uh, in momentum space. Uh, I can make the translation between this uh, and the other thing by considering that uh, this amplitude is actually generated by uh, this word line action. And the gauge field part of this action is really the one that's linear in, uh, in the uh, gauge field is this, it's right, it was right here. Uh, and well, it was written in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the word line action, but I can Fourier transform it and uh, rewrite it as some current of, due to the point like source traveling on this word line. And uh, well, there's a minus here because momentum is conserved. Um, and then I can actually fix my word, uh, my, my action to, um, no, not, not the, uh, the gauge field to be on shell. So I, I can replace uh, A of K by an on shell delta function times some polarization. And in this way, the, uh, I, I can really take this interaction um, and require that it is uh, proportional to the amplitude, um, to the classical amplitude. This is a sort of a heuristic uh, way to do this, um, but it's a very straightforward operation to do because we're you, you, we're just matching the linear uh, interaction interactions on the word line with linear interactions with the source, and want the source to produce amplitudes that are written in this way. And what we get here is just that all the Bs and Cs are, well, actually, I think the conventions here want them to be minus, not just ones, but minus ones to some powers. Uh, but the, the, the way I introduced the factorials here made, made, made them just plus minus ones. So uh, 
Is there any question uh, about this procedure of fixing the coefficients in this more general word line action? Well, if not, let's let me then uh, write uh, the, this word line action again. So, um, well, I, I, I can uh, and, and show how the world sheet arises naturally uh, due to the um, appearance of, of, the, of those exponentials. So the exponential was before was sitting in um, in an amplitude, but that fix it, fixed our coefficients to be nice. And uh, well, I can plug those coefficients inside the, the form that I wrote. And you see here that um, I had, sometimes I had F menu, sometimes I had dual F menu. And the, the trick here is to uh, write it as just one big sum where now I unify F menu and the dual F menu into the self dual part of the field strength. Uh, well, uh, some people sometimes put a half here, but that, that's, that's the convention that is good for our purposes here. And so this action, uh, this action after you've introduced the Bs here can be written just in this way uh, where we put a real part to really extract uh, these two sums. Uh, now, okay, I think I, there is plus one. And now this action looks really chiral. It uh, has a self-dual part. And of course the real Real uh, taking the real part also introduces the anti self dual in in the mix uh, automatically. But what's uh, really important here is that this just uh, the sum here is uh, quite simple. It's not quite the exponent though. So the exponent was sitting in the amplitude, but when we were fixing our um, our, our interaction word line our word line interactions we got a function that's not really an exponent so i will call this act uh, this function t so t by definition is the following uh series uh sorry Mm, yeah, and this is actually well. It, it, it's a simple function; it can be resummed. But for our purposes, I guess it's more important to say that it can also be written as an integral. So now that we have this form of our action, we can really write it as a double integral. Um, where this integral from zero to one, real part of i u mu a nu, and then we have the exponent. So instead of an exponent, we have an integral of an exponent in the action. And this integral uh, gave us this uh, two uh, extra integration. So uh, what we see here is um, this exponent acting on our self-dual field strength that actually just translates it into the complex. So let me rewrite it in as a world sheet even further. So 
we see here that the exponent has translated, sorry, um, translated our word line uh, to the complex, uh, to a complex trajectory. So this is uh, called, the, so, something like this is well known. It's called the Newman Janus shift. So now we're working, of course, with squared curve in gauge theory, but uh, you, it can be traced back to the way the current, the Kerr solution in general relativity was formulated in the first place uh, by a complexification procedure um, uh, from, from a Schwarzschild uh, solution. Uh, and so there, there's a remnant of this human genus shift uh, sitting in the exponent uh, of the minimal coupling amplitude corresponding to curve uh, to, to curve black holes, but here in this action we see it um, being here. So here we are really shifting things on the world sheet. So we imagine a word line, um, but then we imagine that there is a um, um, complex perpendicular orthogonal um, translation and there's a world sheet that looks like this and the interrogation really goes over it uh, let me call it sigma and so uh, I guess uh, still at the level of gauge theory it it's an it's a nice uh, consistency check to retrieve the, the, the more standard uh, Newman Janus shift written in the following way. So in fact, this was the EFT part of the interaction, but there was already uh, but there was already the uh, minimal part, the Coulomb part of the interaction just here. So I can write it really as this, uh, where A is the one form. Uh, integrated along the uh, the word line, which is now uh, the boundary of the world sheet corresponding to lambda equals zero. Uh, but then the rest is really uh, the real part of the integral over the world sheet of F plus. This is nothing more than this. So this F plus as a two form, you can uh, really expand it as dz mu dz nu, where z is r mu uh, sorry, z tau of lambda equals r of tau plus r I lambda A of tau. So, uh, so this geometric rewriting is really very simple, but moreover, we can also integrate it by parts because uh, away from the source, so this is uh, an integral of a world sheet away, away from the source. So uh, away from the source, uh, F DF plus, is df plus i df uh, dual, they're both zero. So f plus can be written as a uh, as d a plus, where a plus is some uh, uh, one uh, one form. Uh, so they're zero uh, separately. This is always zero, but this is uh, zero, uh, only away from the source. Uh, and so we can really uh, integrate it by parts. We, we plug in dA plus here. And uh, well, of course, A plus on the, on the boundary, you can pick a plus to be such that um, 
it is A. So intuition by parts here gives you um, really an integration just over the boundary, assuming that of course on, on, the, on these pieces, nothing happens because they go to infinity. Um, so what you have is really uh, after you integrate this by parts is again, a word line action, but over a translated uh, word, word line into the complex, exactly. But the Newman Janus shift, so here the Newman Janus shift was very, uh, had a variable lambda going from zero to one, but here it's really set to one. So it really is a, a shift by the full spin length. Um, as uh, something that is is even closer to what was happening with the Kerr uh, black hole, um, the, the, the way the Kerr black hole solution was generated in the first place. Uh, so you see, it, this is really um, a Coulomb-like uh, action where all of the spin information is just uh, appears due to this shift. Um, so, um, so well, very good. I, uh, again, I cannot stress it, this enough. Please ask questions if uh, I'm being too fast. Uh, hi, Alex. Yeah. Uh, is your final formula dependent on the gauge u squared equal to one? Uh, no, uh, because this form is gauge invariant with respect to, to that. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thanks, Mao. Um, so let me then go to curve. So this is the part where some double copy uh, is going to happen. Um, so um, yeah, let me take this version this ver version of the action to double copy it. Um, so the first thing I have to do if I want to do something relevant for gravity, I want to covariantize it. So I put a covariant derivative here. So that, so far, this is just imagining the same thing uh, as before, but in curved space. Um, now there's um, um, there's a problem that arises here. Uh, because in curved space, this operation, um, uh, well, maybe there are different ways to, to do this. Actually, um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just try to uh, do it slightly different from what is done in the paper. I guess I'll, I'll just try to retain this form of the action, but uh, I still need before I will uh, before I um, double copy it. I I want to make it more like Young Mills, so I want to uplift it, uplift it to Young Mills. So I'll write the corresponding uh, action as follows. So uh, now F menu will have an, an extra index. Um, so let me put um, so there will uh, so I want to introduce some new uh, color function on the world sheet uh, on the word line, uh, which well or, or on the world sheet. Um, I well, I'm not sure if 
it should depend also on, on the word line or uh, if, if I write it properly. Uh, but let me cook this up in the following way. So uh, if I really want to understand everything in curved space, maybe I even uh, might want to introduce a lambda dependence here, um, which would just be due to um, uh, due to parallel transport uh, with respect to, to lambda. So that would that would be something that I would have to uh, impose if I wanted to consider it as a function not of just tau but of lambda. Um, so, but well, the subtleties aside, uh, I want to write my action as something like that. Um, F a so it's still the, the, um, the self-dual part of z of tau and lambda. Uh, well, actually, yeah, if, if I introduce z, then I don't need to, um, uh, I, 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 it, it's already shifted by, by virtue of putting a variable dependent on lambda inside. Uh, so another way of uh, considering this would be uh, would probably be still to just consider everything like this. But having things written in this way. So th this still looks fully covariant, as far as I can tell. Um, so this form would be even more covariant. Uh, and I think the subtleties between this and uh, one and, and the other uh, are uh, maybe, uh, well, there are subtleties. So, so far, what I've done is basically made it more covariant uh, and made it more non-abelian. And making it non-abelian made me introduce uh, a new index here, which is contracted with some color function. And so my double copy now will be, uh, well, it will be motivated by the fact that it works and it makes something sensible, uh, but it will be the following. So I will write really the same thing and I will retain uh, uh, the four velocity and the spin, but I need to do something with color, of course. And the, the trick here is just to re replace it by another kinematic function. So now uh, velocity. And let me just switch indices uh, slightly, where now A and B are uh, frame indices. And the point is that um, what should I write instead of the field strength? Um, well, usually think in, in, in the double copies that uh, appeared in this conference so far, you want to replace field strength by, uh, uh, well, double, double copy field strengths and get uh, the Riemann tensor. But in this case, uh, it, the index structure uh, seems to suggest that a sensible uh, object to write here would be the self-dual part, uh, sorry, self-dual part of the spin connection. Um, so, well, and I claim that this is going to do something with, uh, well, some, it, it's going to be something relevant for, um, for curves. Uh, so the spin connection is, uh, well, this is the, 
I wrote the self dual part, but uh, more generally, it's written with respect to um, tetrad. So it's not the body fixed tetrad anymore, it's the tetrad defined in the full space time. Um, and I realized that I'm going too, too slow, but uh, let me at least get to something uh, where my claim uh, gets more meaning. So, so I claim that the, this action that I cooked up using a slightly awkward, maybe exotic version of the double copy of at the at, at classical level, uh, it has something to do with uh, her interactions with the graviton loop. And uh, well, it turns out that it really works. So I can expand this exponent. Um, well, I can first undo the integration again. You remember that T, uh, I, I can go back to the, um, to the form where uh, it was really just a sum, an exponent-like uh, sum over N with factorials being shifted by one. Um, and then I'll write uh, this, uh, yeah, I guess, this index was a bit awkward. Uh, and then I can write it in this way. Um, so I'll just. And I guess the point is that um, uh, the uh, the spin connection it knows about the uh, it, it 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 is proportional to the linear at least the linear uh, gra graviton uh, the linear curvature um, and so it can really be rewritten uh, as the following action. So there will be, again, if you don't want to write it in terms of uh, a real part of something chiral, you have to rewrite it. You have to separate the sum into two pieces. One will look like it involves um, the, cur the Riemann tensor. And the other part will involve the dual uh, Riemann tensor. And all of these interactions will pop out of that word line action that I wrote before uh, on the nose. So, well, uh, at least up to high order interactions that uh, I was actually neglecting quite a lot. Um, but uh, it means, but all of the non trivial information is really due to the linearized uh, theory here. Uh, this form is just a way to make, to write something fully covariant well, that's linear in the Riemann tensor. And that's uh, so it has no linear terms in H, but they are required by uh, full covariance. And this is the uh, the effective Kerr uh, uh, word line action. That can be found in, in this very form in uh, in, in Levi Steinhoff, for instance. So um, normally they put, more generally they put three coefficients here. They call them like this, C, B, S, to K. But here they're set to, to once or to minus once. And uh, yeah, 
this sort of double copy that I used uh, actually worked in an trivial way to produce just the same uh, action. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess I should be stopping now. I uh, let let me skip to concluding remarks. So uh, we have seen how the world sheet structure, a linear order, uh, appears um, in just trying to couple uh, uh, to couple minimally a spinning particle. Then, uh, well, I didn't discuss it. But the um, this Newman Janus shift by the spin length it is related geometrically to the ring singularity in in in, in inside the curved black hole. Uh, so here that that's just how it looks like how just the curve uh, 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 how uh, how this would, how this ring singularity would look like in the Kirchhoff twisted doublet spheroidal coordinates uh, that are natural and that are used to describe the Kerr uh, Kerr solution. Um, so, well, the, this world should structure it, it sits inside the leading coupling to the graviton. Uh, so, of course, it, it would be interesting to investigate more detailed high order di dynamics of this. Uh, so, um, yeah, and then the other stuff is about the spinorial equations of motion that are also nicely um, uh, can, can be nicely used in the classical setting uh, instead of the uh, usual equations of motion for the uh, for the velocity vector and the spin vector, just encoding encode all that, that classical information inside a massive spinner. Uh, so all of this is complementary to amplitude methods, uh, entirely classical, but is inspired a lot by the amplitude method, uh, in, including the double copy that happened here. So yeah, let me stop here, and uh, maybe there, if there's time for questions, I will be happy. Answer. Yeah, we maybe have time for one quick question and then we need to uh, move on. Um, Ricardo? Hi, Alex. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, maybe just uh, about, uh, do, you, do you think, do you believe that you can extend this to Riemann square operators? Like in general, you can use really as building blocks this uh, shifted uh, F menu or uh, Riemann tensor. Uh, at all orders. Yeah, so, well, high orders, um, yeah, it would be very nice to go beyond. Uh, be going beyond has a lot of ignorance on different sides of the story, as far as I can tell. And um, at this point, what, I, what I've discussed so far was where we start with something that we know and we connect to something other people know very well. So this is this is where we see that something, at least this stuff seems to make some sense. Um, we need to make more sense out of it to be able to go beyond because that's where nobody knows anything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I uh, I am not sure if any of us any of us has uh, good ideas here, but. Uh, uh, I hope that the that the geometry can can be of help, just differential geometry. Uh, uh, but there, there's still some different ways to regard all of that. Uh, like one thing that, for example, I could get away with in the linear order uh, uh, discussion was not really care about if stuff is for velocity of or a momentum but uh at high orders if i go to the high to the next order i really need to be sure that i'm working in the right formalism and uh it's likely that actually i will not i, I should also introduce momentum entirely in the action as a new variable for 
Uh, also, if this structure persists at high order, say it means there is some group theoretic reason why sh this should be the case. Uh, I believe, like, um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, there should be some fundamental reason. Why. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Hopefully, there is. If 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 high order interactions of Kerr are still geometrically fixed, you know, but the problem is that even as far as I can tell, even even the jar people are not entirely sure if they are really fixed. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, let let's hope that they're fixed, and then maybe this um, uh, uh, this viewpoint can be useful in going beyond uh, linear, linear interactions in in the Riemann tensor. Uh, 